as we take a look at our scripture reading for this morning. And I want to thank all of the brothers that have led us in our worship service thus far. Continue to pray for our efforts as we continue to come together even more so as a unit of one. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it reads like this. Pray this then, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen? Amen. Today we begin part six of our new self-honesty series we've been focusing on all month long. But before we get to that, once again, let's go back over what we've been concentrating on. Because we use these things as a way of latching onto what we should remember the whole month is focusing on it. So if you're able to, repeat after me. My honesty and truthfulness, my honesty and truthfulness. With, God with God is my most important relationship, most important relationship. With, the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, which compels me to own, me to own every significant relationship in my life, every relationship in my life. knowing that these relationships include my relationship with Jesus, my, with Jesus. my spouse, if I have one, spouse, yes. amen, if you don't pray, amen, that can change, <laughs> my, father, my father, my mother, my mother children, children, brothers and sisters, brothers. and my own life also, my own life also. in that order. Today we're going over the perfect plan so you can stand the sequel, amen, the perfect plan so you can stand the sequel. Now, for those of you who missed last Sunday, I am so sorry for you. Because part one was pretty interesting, amen? It was so interesting, we had to extend it to part two for today. But we're going to catch you up on what we did last Sunday so you can be right on the same wavelength as everybody else, amen? Amen. So for some of you, it's review. For others, it's brand new. Either case, you're going to smile anyway. Hallelujah, somebody. First of all, church, as we look and review Matthew, Matthew, written by one of the apostles, Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was not a good guy. Matthew was a professional leg breaker. Matthew was the guy who would say, you better have my money or I will break your legs. And if you have my money, I might still break your legs. Amen. That's how Matthew used to roll back in the day. Because see, tax collectors were your least favorite person in the entire Jewish culture. Because they were low down people. Why am I bringing this up? Well, the thing is, he's not someone people would have picked to be a guy writing to us about Jesus. So a lot of times we think, well, I'm not the likely person that God would want to use in a situation, but actually God likes to use folk who don't look like the typical folk that should be used. Amen? So if you say, well, I'm probably the least likely person God would want to use, guess what number you are on the candidate list? Amen, somebody. Now, as we look over this real quick, we're talking about the perfect plan. We go over the word perfect, P-E-R-F-E-C-T. As a review, and this is part, check your notes or go ahead and take your fresh notes, amen? The perfect plan means that not that you will become faultless or errorless, okay? Let's not put an unrealistic goal on ourselves so you can guilt yourself out of trying. Uh, you know, what we do is this. We say, well, I can't be perfect, so I might as well quit right let's let's please not use that lame childish excuse to not try because even though you don't get your job right every day you don't quit and not take your paycheck right somehow you work through that right well you know then we ought to be able to work through some other stuff that really means more than the paycheck first of all the first thing we have to understand in getting a perfect relationship with God because a lot of people say well I know Jesus Jesus know me he might not really you know you know people know your names especially in the age of Facebook and Instagram and Twitter people say well I know him because they're my Facebook friend but you don't know them you might be connected to them 
but you don't really know them because you haven't spent any time. Everybody say that. Right, so you know somebody because you spend some what? Okay, so now the question is, are you spending any with God? Now, I'm not talking about wake up in the morning, ooh, Jesus, amen, boom, I'm done. God is good, God is great, thank you, Lord, for the food, amen. Oh, Lord, I'm about to fall asleep. Oh, Lord, just watch over me as I sleep. Praise you, thank you, Lord. Now, what marriage? Amen, somebody. Now, what marriage would last if that's the only time you checked in with your spouse? You see, a relationship means I am investing myself into you and you're investing yourself into me. Okay, see, let, let, me, let, me, let me get deeper than that. A lot of people say, well, I'm not cheating if I hadn't done anything sexually. Now, that's actually a lie. See, when you invest emotionally into someone else, no, nobody want to talk about that. Is, is, that a, is that a sore spot? We don't want to go there. Is, is that what this is? is, is, is we, all of a sudden, we went into intervention mode. Okay, you see, see if I invest effort, energy, and interest, that's a loss of my integrity in my initial institution. Amen. amen. Don't ask me to do that again. <laughs> I've got, thank you, Lord. All right. Amen. <laughs> you can be cheating and not touch nobody. Because if you're spending time away from home, those who have ears, let them hear. And investing in time, and you're doing timeshare somewhere else. Then you're cheating. So now, the question now is, then are you cheating in your relationship with God? Because if you put the time, the quality time, not sisters, all sisters. All sisters understand the concept of quality time. Please raise your hand. Oh, okay, so I'm, let, me speak to the, let me speak to the sisters real quick. Sisters, so... Your quality time means that should his attention be distracted somewhere else? Okay, let me ask another question, sisters. Quality time means that the football game should be going on in the background. Okay, quality time is he should be hammering and banging on the car while he's spending the quality time with you. In fact, he should even have his friends in the room with him and they kicking it and all that, but that still should count as quality time? And so God is saying, no, your TV time don't include me. No, your phone time don't include me. No, your job time don't include me. No, hanging out with your buddies don't include me. I want the same quality time that you want, brothers. When you want quality time with her, you don't want to spend quality. Well, let me ask you then. Brothers, all brothers that understand quality time, raise your hand. Brothers, you better raise your hand if you're married. All right. I just, hey, hey, I, I'm trying to help you out. Now, brothers, it's quality time you sitting at the mall watching her shop. Oh, 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 oh. What a participation congregation, amen. So, we understand quality time when it comes to us. Now, should not the Father be deserving of quality set aside scheduled, precious, don't interrupt it unless somebody has died, time. All right. Praise God seven different ways in the morning when you wake up. Praise him for his creation, Elohim. Praise him for his grace and his mercy. Praise him for being a protector in your situation. Praise him for being a healer when you were sick, whether it was physically, mentally, or financially. Praise him for the things he's given you in your hands. Some of y'all drove up in, I didn't see nobody come up here in a cart and a buggy. Amen? If God gave you a hoopty, praise him for your hoopty. Because your hoopty might be better than the new car because at least your hoopty don't have a monthly payment. Amen. Amen. See, that's a blessing both ways. Amen. Amen. Don't envy what somebody else have. You don't want the headache that probably came with it. Now, secondly, examine your spirit. 
your soul, your body, and is it in God's will? Your spirit is your real you. Your soul is your personality. You can be spiritual and be an ugly acting person anyway. So it's vital that you police yourself. Now, those who are experts at policing others, let's take that same laser view and point it dead in a mirror. Because what reflects, amen, is what we need to improve upon. We need to improve upon not only our mental health, but our physical health. Our bodies reflect the lack of or the amount of discipline we have privately. Oh, don't nobody want that. I'm not saying you got to become a world-class athlete. And I'm not saying you got to eat Brussels sprouts every meal. But your body is the housing of the Holy Spirit. And if your body can't move, how are you going to minister to others and you can barely catch your breath walking with them? See, that's not God's will for your life to be weak. But the same holds true even financially. God did not call you to be in debt. How can you be a blessing to someone else and you can't pay your light bill? You didn't want that either. Amen. Here we go. Request from God your needs, desires, and wants. You've got to request it. Close mouth. Okay, amen. F, forgive self and others with God's forgiveness. I have to work on this because I, I have a problem. I have to work on forgiving myself too. Okay, I'm just being honest. You know, I, I feel like, well, since I'm the preacher, I should have never even made a mistake. I have to remember, I'm a man too. Okay. So you step on my foot, it's going to hurt. Right? I'm going to get over it quicker. I should. Amen? But it doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Okay? But we have to forgive ourselves and others. E, equip yourself against evil with the whole armor of God. You have to realize that every day is a spiritual battle. And Satan wants you to lose. And I'm going to be honest. Here's something, I was going to leave this at the end of the sermon, but let's go ahead, let's, let's, let's eat some dessert before we go to the meal. Amen? Because I do that sometimes. You know, amen. I'm not the only one. I just said it publicly. I confessed it. Y'all do it too. Okay, now. <laughs> Equip yourself with the whole arm of God because here's the only way you lose the spiritual battle. It's not when you fail. When you try to do right and you really screw it up bad, that's good. Because you learn from mistakes quicker than you do from victories. Now, the only way you lose is by quitting. See, when you fall off the wagon, get back on the wagon while it's still rolling slow. Don't wait till it gains momentum and you can't catch it. Best time to get back on the wagon is the day you fell off. I just drank them an hour ago. Then you wasted 60 minutes and should have already started quitting right then. Amen? All right. C, choose one purpose instrumental goal to fulfill for today. Oh, we're going to deal with that today, y'all. Amen? And then turn all words, thoughts, feelings, and deeds into love deposits today. By the way, the T, I'm going over the T tonight in vivid detail for the 5 o'clock sermon. Amen? That turn all that negativity into positive, that's for tonight. So don't miss it tonight at 5 o'clock. They call that a teaser in TV. All right? So now let's get to it. First of all, praise God seven times. In Psalms 118 verse 24, the New American Standard says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us rejoice in the day that God gave us. Every single day is a blessing for you to walk anointed in God. And so for you to wake up and predetermine the day is bad is a curse upon your day from your own mouth. Quit that. 
Don't allow Satan to use your mouth against your day. Let's not give him that kind of authority. I don't think he should be invited to the party. Amen? Don't invite him to your party. All he does is tear stuff up, eat your food, and don't chip in for the punch. Amen. Seven times a day, David writes in Psalms 119, and I praise you because of your righteousness ordinances. Because God does not beat us up the first time we mess up or the second time we mess up or the third time we mess up. That's okay, y'all gonna amen me in a minute. Or the fourth time we messed up or the fifth time we messed up or the sixth time. Are you kidding me? And I can't praise him? I can't praise him enough. If we had 10,000 tongues, we could not praise God enough. You are sitting here right now poised for the blessing of your life right now. And it is not because you did everything right, but it is because of the righteousness of he who sent his son for us us when Christ died for us he made sure that our lack of self-control and our lack of consistency and our lack of lack and fill in the blank Christ makes up for the lack we naturally have in this human flesh and for that alone he's worthy for that alone he is a God that you should have the most utmost loyalty to and realize that every single day I walk in the power of hope instead of the dismal idea of despair that I can never get it right. The minute you say I can't ever give it right, you are allowing Satan to have a place at your party. You know all they do is eat your food. Don't even chip in for the punch. Oh, amen, somebody. See, you've got a spirit. That's who you are. But not only that, you have a soul and you live in a body. You are triune in how you were created. God created you in his image, not because of arms, legs, heads, and hair and all that, because God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. So you are you in flesh, you in spirit, you in soul. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, soul, body. You are in the image of God. When you look in the mirror and if the only thing you pay attention to is what the body is doing or how to please the body or how to make up the body or how you should lose weight in the body and that's all you focus on, what about your soul? What about your spirit? See, you can have one thing and a, and a ton of it and the lack of another leaves you out of, ba out of balance. And it's a bad thing to be out of balance. Amen? See, because, see, your soul, that's your real you. In the Greek, it's the pneuma. And then your, your soul, excuse me, your spirit, and then your soul is your souk or your personality, and then your body is your soma, which is your house. This is who you are. Being honest with who yourself, your new self-honesty. Be honest with who you are. Stop limiting who you are based on what you see in a mirror. Stop judging whether you've had success, just whether or not you kept up your diet or not. Stop measuring yourself with physical things only. You are bigger than trying to look like an image you see on TV or on the internet or in a magazine. You are God's son or God's daughter. That's who you are. You are not beautiful because you're a black woman. You're beautiful because you're God's woman. <laughs> Examine yourself by God's will. Am I really doing your will? See, after you praise God seven times in the morning, then you need to examine whether you're doing God's will. Now, the first thing is this. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. The first key is this. Am I trying to make me more like Christ? Or am I saying I'm praying on it? 
I'm working on that preacher. I'm working on that elder. I'm working on that deacons. I'm still working on me. Y'all pray for me because I got to give her a piece of my mind. That's not working on. It's not. Listen. If If you weren't great, greatness would not be expected of you. If you weren't the great woman and man of God that God really called you to be, God wouldn't even put people around you that's asking you why you ain't at church. You understand what I'm saying? If, if you weren't, if, if there wasn't an entire nation awaiting for the message of Christ to come through your mouth, not mine, your mouth because the calling of God is on your life today and you act like it hasn't been you're acting like well if I go to church that's my calling no that's your duty privilege and you ought to be thankful for it. your calling is going out to tell somebody how God brought you out of the pits of hell and put you back in your sane and right mind despite how many ways you tried to go crazy. And almost did it. Amen, somebody. But if greatness wasn't in you, greatness wouldn't be expected of you. I'm not scolding you. I'm letting you know what is before you is beautiful and bold and to bring glory to him. But it cannot happen with you volunteering to act like, I don't know what to do. 2 Corinthians 13, it says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Everybody say yourselves. Or do, not, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. The R part is request from God what you need. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Oh, this is the King James Version. Amen. Let your request, moderate request be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. Somebody say everything. everything. By prayer. Somebody say prayer. And supplication. With thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Listen. Members of the Church of Christ should understand what supplication means. Now, it might not be talked about a lot in the church, but the bottom line is, when's the last, I'm going to ask you a question, when's the last time you actually went on a fast? A real fast. Now, those of you who have health problems, you have to still take your medicine, and you cannot exclude meals that you have to have. Amen now. So if you're a diabetic and you have to eat a certain amount of sugar, you eat that certain amount and you fast outside of what you don't need. All right? Let's make that disclaimer. Amen? All right? But now a fast means this. See, what you do when you fast, you condition your body. Okay, fasting is important because Jesus says, you don't have to fast while, I, while he was there, but he says, you will have the chance to fast when I'm gone. Well, he's gone. Holy Spirit is here right now. Your chance to fast is now each and every day. You don't tell me when you fast and you should wash your face and wash your head and you shouldn't look like you suffering from hunger. Oh, oh y'all got a snicker bar. I'm not going to make it till 8 o'clock because I'm fasting. Ah, oh, shut it down right there. Fasting, in its simplest terms, because I got to go on, amen, is this. Fasting is practicing for the temptation that comes down the road. Now hear me out, hear me out. Fasting is when you deny your body something that it craves naturally. Amen? It's natural for you to eat. And when you are hungry, what do you typically do when you're hungry? Okay. But when you are able to bring your body into subjection of what your spirit and soul needs to do, you began to tell your body no when it says yes. You tell your body uh-uh when it says 
Uh -huh. You began to practice for the moment of temptation that you're going to need that strength. Okay, you're looking at me weird. David didn't walk up on Goliath and just threw a rock for the first time, and that's when he slew Goliath. If you understand the story of David and Goliath, David had practiced before that. And he had told King Saul, he says, King Saul, this uncircumcised Philistine, he says, I tell you what, I killed the lion when the lion came up against me with my sheep. That means David got used to swinging low. And then he says, when a bear showed up, I killed it. So that means David was used to seeing something with big size come to him and try to threaten to kill him. And he says, and this same Philistine, although Goliath was actually from Gath. He says this same uncircumcised person that has the nerve to challenge the army of the Lord, he'll fall before me the same way. And some historians say that when David came up to him, when Goliath began to taunt him, he said, what am I, a dog? You come with me, a stick and a sling? And some historians say that David did this, and David came to Goliath and said, hey, you know what? I don't even need this stick for you. Why? Because he had practiced before the real battle came. See, when you can stop eating on purpose, then eating a diet, not a problem. Amen, somebody. Request made known to God. Jesus answered and said to him, Have faith in God, for verily I say to you, Whoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he hath said will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. A lot of times I use the New American Standard and the Message Version, but I wanted to use the King James on this particular point. Whatsoever he asks, if he asks without doubting, he gets it. When you go to God and you ask in his will, how do I know it's in his will? Well, let's just check the record. If you're praying for someone else's wife or husband, that ain't in his will. Okay. If you're praying for revenge, that's not in his will for you to pray for it. That's God's. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay, amen. So what you need to ask for now, I'm trying to get done. I might have to go part three. Church, the prayer of all prayers is the one that a little old boy prayed to God about. He said, I, I'm a youth. I don't know what I'm doing. Give me wisdom to lead your people. And because that's what he asked God for, God said, because you weren't motivated by selfish means, and because you prayed for something that would help you serve me, I will not only give you what you asked for, but I will give you everything you didn't ask for. Because you didn't ask for vengeance on your enemies, because you didn't ask for wealth, because you didn't ask to be the biggest rock on the block, I'm going to make you the wisest of all men that ever walked the planet. And then years after you are gone, people are still talking. In fact, I just talked about him, and it's 2014, and God is still delivering on that promise to him. So how do we pray in God's will? Find it. Pray about that. Amen? What is your will in my life? Lord, what do you want me to do? And when God starts talking to you, you'll know it because you'll be in your nose in the Bible because that's how God talks back to us today. See, God gave us the Holy Spirit to speak to us, but we can't hear him if we don't know his vocabulary. Amen? And then we have to make our request known to God for your needs because if not, how you know you need God if you don't ask for it? You might think that you did it all yourself. The F part is forgiving others as and, and yourselves. It says in Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debt as we've forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It can't get more simpler than that. We have to. Listen. There's no reason for you to continue to hold yourself captive to what somebody did to you. Because every time you can't deal with being around them, you relive the pain that you suffer in their hands. Now, why would you want to keep rehearsing 
some of the worst moments in your life. Well, Brother Paul, you don't understand. That person took my virginity from me. That's deeper. That's something I can't recover from. Oh, yes, you can because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you could ask or think. But you don't understand. That person took my child from me and my child is in a grave right now. Yes, but now you have a child that's already in heaven and you got somebody to meet. Brother Paul, but you don't understand. They ruined my whole career. Now you think your career is ruined in this corner of the world and you can't go somewhere else and start your career over. Brother Paul, you don't understand. I just can't. Okay. Fair enough. You win. Let's do it your way. You can't forgive them. Okay. Now, know the cost of your decision. I can't forgive you. So that means every time you walk around smiling, I think you're being funny. Now, I got more on my head. Every time I see you prosper, I'm wondering, God, why you let them prosper and I'm not prospering? Now you're mad at God. Then every time you see them, they seem to sleep good and walk around with a pep in their step. And they walk by you like they ain't never done nothing to you. And you say, you got some nerve walking by me like you ain't done nothing. You ain't apologized to me the right way. Mm -mm -mm. And you putting yourself through hell on earth. And then you die. Yeah, amen. First time saying go to hell ain't bad in church. And you're going to go to hell for that. Now, let's change that. You forgive them, you let it go. You release your spirit from the captivity of that moment. Then you began to heal physically if there was a physical injury from that moment. Then... And in most cases, when you come back from something, you become stronger. Amen? Because you now have the victory through God from that situation. And because you are stronger, you are able to hold fast better. And you might actually go from being on the B team to the A team as a result of your recovery. And not only that, now you're able to look at others stewing in the same mess and you're able to bring them up as you go up. And then your life has a purpose from your pain instead of being crippled from your pain. And now you have a purpose of God, whereas you took something that most would have crippled and crumpled and died under, and now you are flourishing. God might even create a whole 501c3 under your pain and all kinds of folks are delivered to heaven as a result of the pain someone inflicted upon you to the point where you will look back at them and say, I didn't know what it was back then, but what you meant for bad is now my blessing in my life. Joseph could have said the same thing. My brother sold me, my own family did me wrong. So you ain't new, amen. But he says, what you meant for bad, God orchestrated it so that I would be here to deliver you. And now here I am, the second man in command over all of Egypt. Because you did me wrong, it put me in the right place of anointing. Equip yourself against evil. Listen, you got to be prepared like it says in Ephesians chapter 6, be prepared, you're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take up all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is the indispensable weapon. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. 
pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirit up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Equipping myself means that as I equip myself, I watch out for you too. See, a lot of times we only catch that arm, arm yourself with the full armor of God and breastplate of white righteousness and all of that stuff, and we think I'm just arming myself up. But see, when you arm yourself up, see, did anybody see the movie 300? Has anybody seen that movie? Now, there was a very, very telling thing that was a very true historical fact. They said that the whole point of the Spartans fighting system was it was a phalanx. It's called a phalanx phalanx where you bring all the shields together and you're all in the same alignment so that one man protects the other man's odd shoulder so that's why the guy that was crippled couldn't be in the army because his shoulder was too low and would have allowed for one person to get stabbed and if one goes down all goes down well guess what church we are in the Lord's army and you know we are on the Lord's battlefield so if one soldier go down we all go so I can't out of jealousy because you cuter than me and all y'all cuter than me amen but I can't let my jealousy rejoice when I think I see you falling because you cuter than me that's what you get now see if you fall what I don't realize is while I'm rejoicing while you falling the spirit coming at my neck but I'm too selfish to realize that amen so I've got to learn how to rejoice when someone else is bringing you good news. Oh, child, my child just graduated from school. And then you don't jump in and say, well, my child graduated. No, no, stop. Jump back in your cheerleading mode and cheer. Yay for your son. Yay for your daughter. Yay, 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 yay! Yay! Now, now church, because the minute you start saying, well, you know, my child, da, 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 you're competing. You're resentful. And see, it's a very subtle thing, but see, you got to realize how Satan works. Satan works in subtleties. It's a subtle resentment that you're going good, so let me, let me, let me one-up you. Somebody said, my child got straight B's and your child got straight A's. Shut up. And say, that's awesome. Maybe we ought to do something for your baby. Let's go get them some ice cream after church. So that not only you are happy for them, but I'm happy for them. So that when you come and celebrate, something's going to be more apt. Say, you know what? You was all right till my child was straight B's and your child got straight Let me bring my child near your child. Because you got a pretty good child in that category. Amen. Because you know kids. Amen. And you say, hey, now we're building together. Your shield is up on my shoulder. Amen? And we protect each other with the armor of God. And we march through the battlefield together. Amen, somebody? It says, choose an instrumental goal. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. If you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then you choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods of your ancestors worship from the countryside beyond the river and one on the gods of the Amorites or whose land you are now living. As for me and my family, we will worship God. Choose a purpose goal. You know, a lot of times people say, well, what is a purpose goal? See, the problem is a purpose goal is not you saying, well, my goal today is I'm going to read my Bible. Really? Really? That's your purpose goal. I'm going to read. That's a righteous thing to read the Bible. Yes, but it's expected. That's like eating. You're supposed to eat. You won't be able to walk around. That's not a goal. That's an expectation. A purpose goal is when you get up and you do something for somebody else. You see, we intend to exist in a very selfish vacuum in our faith. You know what, George? I need to come up with a, a, a something to do. You know? You know, Dietrich, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to do a Christian thing, but you know what? I don't know what to do. 
I mean, I could do something for the hungry or the shelter, but I mean, what do you do? You want to make sure people are sincere. Here you go. Coming up with excuse number one, excuse number two. Okay, then. But then what could I do that could be a goal that's a good thing on behalf of God that can legitimately help me become a better person? Dietrich, give me one thing that I could do that the church does in the community. What is it? What is hope works? So we have a project at the church called Hope Works. It helps those who are felons have a second chance to get a job. Oh, you said you wanted something to do? Oh, there it is. Oh, well, you don't want to work with felons because that scares you. Okay, Dietrich, give me another one. <laughs> Families in transition. What is family in transition? Oh, so we have a program that helps single mothers get back on track. Oh, so much for the scare thing. Give me one more, Dietrich. German Shire Elementary, Elementary School. What do we do at German Shire Elementary School? Okay. Amen. Serve. Okay, so. Well, I didn't know we had all that at the church. Well. Maybe you didn't go to a church where they actually reach out to the community like they did South Germantown. But see, God made sure that we made the opportunity available for you so that when you go before the throne of Christ and he asks you, what did you do for somebody else other than your own family and your own tight circle of friends? What did you do for somebody that was in need in your own community? You have that opportunity to say, Lord, I did A, B, C, D, E, F, G all the way down to Z, and now I'm on A3, A4, A5, A6. That opportunity is there for you. Sometimes we can say we don't know, but guess what? Now you do know. And what you don't know, contact Dietrich and George, and they'll tell you more of what you can do. Why? You need to do something outside of you in order to grow you. That's the quality time that God is talking about. Amen? I'm going a little longer than usual, but y'all just going to have to pray for me today because I'm going to get through this. Last but not least, turn our words, thoughts, feelings, and deeds into love deposits instead of love withdrawals. And we're going to go over this tonight in more detail. But the words that come out of your mouth must be words of uplift and words of praise. Somebody say, you too skinny. Say, I'm a thin piece of leather well put together. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Somebody say, well, you just got too much weight. Say, no, I got just enough weight to push my way through to a breakthrough. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, you just too dark. I am, I am dark yet comely. Well, you just read. I said, yes, I'm red because I got the blood of Christ all over my face. You got to stop letting you put you down. You've got to realize that God is in the midst of all that you do and that God has anointed you and has called you out of confusion so that you can bring a light to someone else. And God has decided to use you, the most unlikely vessel, just like Levi or Matthew who wrote this particular book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that God has decided to use you with your flaws, with your hangups, with your ticks, amen, and we'll use all of that for the benefit of the glory of the kingdom. And you don't have to start giving excuses like Moses says, I, 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 I stutter, Lord, I can't do it. God will put Aaron next to you and say, I got somebody to take care of your stuttering. And then even if you got to build something, you got no experience of building, God can take somebody like Noah and build something that is still standing today, no matter what it is. God is able to give you provisions for the vision he's put in your life. Now, all you've got to do is get up. That's what time it is. Get up. Because there are souls dying because they need your ministry touch. 
and you need to touch them so that you can grow in Christ. This is a call to action. The perfect plan so you can stand. So that you can stand.